My next subject is uh, Edmund Bale. And out of curiosity, how many people have heard of Bale before? I'd just like to see hands. A couple of you. Very good. Okay. He was an interesting person. He was originally a chemist, um, a very well-educated chemist, by the way. If he didn't have his PhD, he nearly had it. Um, he studied uh, chemistry and chemical physics and physics. He was uh, an advocate of the most modern methods. He, his, his early career was as a chemist for the railroads. But he came under the, he met uh, Bertillon, and he eventually became Bertillon's successor. But, and, and he was very devoted, just like Ricard was for some reason. They, they both looked on Bertillon very kindly, although of course, he was not the very you know, was not the scientist that either Lacard or or Bale was. Anyway, um, uh, Bale was uh, was Lacard's contemporary. He was born. Remember, I said uh, Lacard was born in 1877. He was born in 1878 or nine. It was the year or two after Lacard. And in fact, there's uh, one of the reasons you may not have heard of him. We're not talking about him today. Is that uh, although he revolutionized in, for the Paris laboratory. It was no longer the fingerprint bureau that Bertillon had started. Uh, it was actually a real laboratory uh, with all the most modern equipment of the uh, time, although like Lacard's laboratory was on the, on the top floor. You can see the skylights there. Um, he, um, there, I, there are two sources, there are probably other sources. I know of two sources for this, uh, for this story, but he was assassinated on the steps of his laboratory first of all. And the one account is um, in Time Magazine, actually, the time there's, there's, a, there's a notice. If you go online and look up Edmund Bale, one of the first things that will come up is French's, uh, France's top policeman, his Sherlock Holmes, has died. And he was, he was assassinated on the, on the steps, basically, of the laboratory by a fellow who thought that he had given false evidence in a case. So it was just a shot, brought an end to his career a couple years after this uh, the other thing is in, in Harry Sutterman's book, which I would highly recommend if you're interested in uh, sort of history, which I read as a kid again in the early history of forensic science, because um, he studied, even though he's from Sweden, he studied with Lacard in Lyon, and his, um, it's called A Policeman's Lock. Um, and he tells a story about how Lacard had just been visiting, actually, his laboratory the day before this happened. He was really tragically struck by the whole thing because Lacard thought so highly of uh, Bale. Anyway, the case I'm going to, to talk about involves the discovery of a package in the Bois de Blanc in Paris. It's probably pronounced that way, uh, Patrick or Bois. <coughs> uh, his, his, his gardens. Anyway, and when they opened the package, there was a, there was a body inside, uh, and there were things wrapped separately and so forth. But... Um, the, f the fellow, uh, th th there's, I mean, it's again, like all these cases, there's a big backstory to these things. There's a lot, but I'm going to really concentrate on the scientific evidence. Um, <coughs> but so early on, on, on the 8th of June in uh, 1924, early in the morning, a bicyclist finds the package. They open up. This is a police photograph of the, of the body. And the fellow saw hands and feet protruding, called the police. They, they come, they, they call the... the the authorities, they open it up, and they, they get the body and all these um, um, pieces of clothing that, that came from them. The, uh, they felt the person, and, and the autopsy confirmed that the victim had been bludgeoned, killed by a blow on the head. They thought he was around 60 and 70 years old. Eventually, they identify um, this fellow anyway as, as a fellow named Louis Boulet, and uh, he was a... Uh, uh, he worked in an office. He was a clerk. He had worked there his whole career, 70 years old. And he made, uh, he had some deposits. He had made some mail. He had to send off registered mail and things early in the morning. But nobody ever saw him after that. He just completely disappeared. And anyway, his next of kin, his wife, identified his body. So that was him. But they went a long time without any substantive leads in the case, although. Um, within a few weeks, or a few months anyway, after the uh, case took place, uh, or after the body was found, um, Bale issued a report based on his examination of the, of the dust and dirt on the clothing. And so he found coal, uh, sharp particles of stone is the way they're described, sand grains, sawdust, 
Uh, there's tan cardboard. There's a piece of little red flakes of some kind of a, a paint material. Um, and also um, some uh, two, two fragments of, uh, or actually two uh, small insect-like uh, um, organisms which, which had no eyes. They had very pale you know, gray bodies. And one was a beetle and one was a crustacean that live in totally dark places. They never, never developed eyes. So it was generally believed, and he believed, that the body was kept in a basement some way. Anyway, other than, so, but by means other than, uh, well, other than his, for the first part, they got a, they ended up with a suspect in the case, a fellow named Tessier, who was a concierge um, and knew uh, Boulet because he uh, sometimes acted as his bookmaker. He liked to play small 10, 15 franc bets in those days. And uh, through, a, anyway, through this acquaintanceship and because we're already now talking about, remember the case happened in June, we're already talking now about uh, September, October, when they finally got a, their first suspect in the case. And so they go to the place where he works and also lives and they find a basement, aha, we got a basement down here and there's sand and sawdust on the floor, all looks very good. But immediately on going down there, Bale found that it was not the right place. He said, first of all, there's too much light there. And certain things that he was looking for, coal wasn't there, although there was a coal bin there over to the coal bin lifts inside, there's no, uh, there's no light, there's no, uh, none of these insects in there and the other kinds of things that they were expecting to find. Uh, he doesn't know what to do. He believes it's there, but again, and this is, a, this is a good lesson for all of us and something I always uh, try to keep in mind when I'm working on these cases is, is the um, trying to uh, um, not let your theory of the case get in front of the facts of the case. It wasn't the right place, even though it had a lot of things they expected. The thing, all the things that were supposed to be there weren't there. They had two more searches, and he, each time he found a little more. In fact, once they found a, a torn metro ticket, which was the station that Boulay would get his, uh, would take the metro on every day. Well, but that's all. Finally, through another uh, lead, they came up with a. Um, yet another basement, a, a room. It, was, it didn't belong to him, it belonged to a friend of his, but the friend never used it. As soon as Bale went there, went down a circular staircase, down a completely dark room, Bale puts his flashlight down there, there the, there's the crustacean and the beetles and stuff, they're all down there. That room had everything else. It had the rhodamine uh, painted um, uh, piece of wood, uh, it, had the, it had the cardboard with the right fiber furnish in it, it had the um, pe larger pieces of the grinding stone that he had postulated from the angular pieces of stone that he saw before, all the sand and, and, uh, and sawdust. There were the sawdust was all the right species uh, that were there. Every single thing was there. Uh, and while, again, like in many cases, uh, the, the suspect, of course, denied everything. But eventually, uh, when confronted with all the evidence, he ended up confessing the case. So once again, uh, we've got a solution and a very nice investigative lead uh, remember, um, I, I think all of us should adopt this. We use it as our uh, unofficial <coughs> motto at Microtrace, and I believe in giving credit. Um, it was stolen from Louis Pasteur. You've all heard it. I'm sure Chance Paper prepared mine. Prepare yourself for these things, and you don't get swayed. Don't let your theories, uh, no matter how beautiful they might be, take precedence over your facts. You might actually have a chance of, uh, of doing something, uh, something good. Anyway. Um, the last historical case is from one of my other boyhood heroes who I was fortunate enough eventually to work with, Max Freiselzer, who became head of the Zurich Laboratory. You want to read about him sometime if you ever read, it's required reading in my lab, uh, Thorwald's Crime and Science. And you can read about how as a young um, person who loved microscopy and microchemistry, um, Freiselzer taught courses. Eventually people from the, uh, students from the Zurich police came to his uh, evening extension program. Uh, they asked him if he would look at evidence, he looked for evidence, and eventually he got a, uh, <laughs> he got a letter actually. The, the Thorwell's book doesn't tell all the details, but he got a letter from the chief of police of Zurich, and he said, Skip, you have to understand something. Uh, one time we were talking, he said, when you get a letter from the police in a German-speaking country, it's a serious matter. <laughs> he said he was really scared when he went down there. It turned out it was a very cordial uh, meeting, and the chief of police asked him if he would not be willing to uh, set up a police laboratory for Zurich. And eventually he became head of it. Uh, by the time I knew him, he had, he had retired already. In any case, he worked on a case that was really neat. Now, 
the import of this is going to seem trivial to you, and probably in terms of all of us sophisticated North Americans and others, or Europeans, it will seem trivial. But to the farmer this happened to, it was sad. But this was before he was a police, uh, involved with the police. A farmer went out to his barn, which was, which was about, uh, ab oh, about five minutes from the local house. He went to his barn in the morning one day, and he found out he found all his cows were dead, and they were all lying in pools of their own blood. It had rained the night before. He had washed down all the stalls and everything. It was just a mess, and he was beside himself. The police came out, but since it had rained, there was no scent for the dogs, which they used to track this guy down. However, on the, s on the concrete... Um, the, on the stone, excuse me, out in front of the, the stalls, there was a, a clump of mud, and you see a drawing of it because that's all that appears in the original article of this piece of mud. It had a nail hole in it, but everybody in town had shoes with uh, you know nails like that, so that wasn't much good. Uh, um, Fry Seltzer was called in to uh, look at this, and uh, what he did was a description. These are the kinds of things I used to love when they were details, scientific details in these. And I, and I use this technique actually to this day if I'm sectioning through clumps of soil. He said he aspirated it with a fine aspirator with water for about 30 minutes, and then he let it sit in a bell jar for several hours, and he could cut through it very nicely with a sharp knife. And he noticed that there were four layers there. And he analyzed each of those layers. And so the, f so the layer closest to the shoe was clay. It was yellow clay. By dissolving it in water, there was really nothing else of important there, but it's the kind of clay that you'd see wherever there are inclines that went down would, would wash would, would wash across the roads, uh, the, the paths and roads in, uh, in, that, um, in that village, in that area. But there's nothing else to be found in there. The next layer was brown. There were numerous fragments of plant, plant debris uh, in there. There was one little single ball which he opened up and examined uh, as, a, as a moss. There was also a lot of sphagnum moss in there, which in later years, I was looked back at this one. I had uh, that uh, the well-known potting soil, well, a potting soil case I had, which I described from my uh, my soil class on Monday. Um, anyway, uh, and then the next layer was black. It was full of leaf tissue. There was beech, ash, and maple. Uh, also interesting, there are two parts of of a beetle. This is kind of reminiscent of Edmund uh, Bale's case, but these were beetles that when he went to an entomologist for for solid identification found out they were beetles that live in the leaf litter of forest floors. And then the last layer consists of fine grains and particles of penipodium, goose foot is, is, the, is, the sign, is the common name for it, and that's what grows up around the place. So he gave the investigators his report and they went off and they went, uh, they left the yard and they went through a forest and they crossed a stream and they came out in the town and uh, on a, in an area of the town, uh, it, was about, it was a shortcut. It was about 20 minutes away from the town instead of 30 minutes that it would normally take. And what they found there was a, uh, um, uh, the police started making inquiries. All the people started, you know, getting mad and accusing each other. And they heard, somebody heard a dog bark at that night in, in that person's yard. Anyway, he said, wait a second. He said, you're supposed to go, you got to go through a bog or a marsh of some sort. So he went out with them and with a botanist and they went through it. And they actually found a path that passed from the, the pasture through the, uh, um, uh, through the forest into a bog, across the bog, up the incline, and where it take them to another farm. And on that farm, they talked to the farmer. He had a young man who wasn't, who was, uh, I don't know what the, what the right word for it say, but it wasn't all there. Um, he was mentally uh, was slow. And they went to his uh, room where uh, after immediately denying things, he'd been very rom rom morose, uh, morose, the, the farmer said, and he finally broke down, confessed, and he actually showed him the knife with the cow blood all over. He'd just gone sort of, it seemed like a good idea at the time to him that night. So while this isn't, you know, again, it's an earth-shattering case, it's a very good <laughs> model of how a good stratigraphic soil examination can be conducted. A lot of times today, when I, I just cringe when somebody calls me, I say they want to look at a wheel weld or something like that. Did you take it off? Oh, yeah, we scraped it all off already. Well, you know, it'd be kind of nice to let, you know, to try and get the layer structure. And there, uh, I was fortunate enough, as I said, to spend a lot of time studying with um, Max Freiselser, and there's an earlier skip calendar. Let me give you a, a more recent case. Uh, we conducted, we were contacted in 2004 
by um, Sergeant Collins from Montgomery County Police in uh, Maryland. They'd had for the last two and a half years, they'd been uh, suffering under a uh, serial rapist. The guy's MO, although he would go occasionally go into young women's apartments, he seemed to like to stake out young women. So he parked in a remote area of a parking lot or hidden area or down a street off of a shopping uh, street, something like that. He would apparently lie and wait for them. When they would come back to their cars, open the door and were ready to get in, he would jump in behind them, throw an item of clothing over their head, push them back. Uh, I guess as, as they would say in the cards, they have his, his way with them and then disappear. The women, never, they never heard his voice. They never saw what his look like. He had no description, but of course they had in every single case the same person's DNA from the semen, but not one of them saw him. In an act of desperation, uh, I can only call it because um, they called me with the idea that there's some stains. He left behind two shirts and there's some stains on them. Could you tell us what he was eating? So that's why I called desperate. <coughs> well, we got the shirts in. The shirts had been washed. The stains were almost washed out and we might have been able to get something out of them, but I doubt it. However, instead, I went back to what I always ask my students to do and we weren't looking for contract tracing. We were trying to find out something about the person who wore it. So I vacuumed the clothes. Let me see exactly what I, what order I do this in. Okay, this is just more of the background of the case. We retrieved the shirts. There are the shirts, two athletic shirts. So I vacuumed the shirts and then started looking at the dust. And this is what the dust looked like from one of them. Those of you who collect dust and look at it know that although it looks like a lot of dust, about 80, 85 or 90% of that is skin cells. So this is this was the report of my dust analysis, um, uh, summarized uh, with the, with the main points. The two shirts were worn by the same person. They were worn by a person who worked um, indoors. Um, uh, they uh, they it was near uh, oak trees where he was working because it was uh, cold enough out at that time. Uh, oak trees, by the way, pollinate uh, typically in uh, in temperate climates in about March. Um, the, the owner's occupation was a drywall installer and finisher, and more specifically, and I confirmed this with actually people <laughs> today, uh, the other day who are working on our uh, new addition to our layup, is uh, he works on large-scale commercial projects. <coughs> this this um, gave the police a lead. I would have liked to give them more, but that's what I had. That's what I could reasonably get out of. Now, again, remember, um, there's, there's the analysis, which I'm going to talk about, but there's the inferences. And what I've given you first are the inferences, because once I tell you I was done, you say, well, just like anything. I remember I was a kid and read an article about Fulton, who invented the steamboat, and the article says, oh, yeah, that was real easy. I could have done that. Well, you know, then why didn't you, why didn't you do it? Anyway, as soon as I show you how I did, it'll be as absurdly simple. But anyway, they also uh, got a lot of media coverage. They, set, they used our description of the person. They showed the things on TV. And our inferences were all proven to be correct. Well, so this was, I wrote my report in December. In January 18th or something, I think I, I found a note somewhere. Um, Jack, who's in this room, Jack Kippis said, uh, Sergeant Collins on the phone. I think you want to talk to him. He certainly wants to talk to you. And so I got on the phone with Sergeant Collins. He says, you're not going to believe this. He said that a lot of times during the conversation. He said, yesterday morning, um, we got a, our, the police got a call from the, uh, and I'm just nearly finished up here. I got a call from the, uh, um, we got a call from an old lady, a little nosy old lady, who was looking out her window and she looked next to her and she saw a guy come out of an apartment of a young woman who thought, she thought he had no business being there. So she called us. A couple, couple uh, blocks away, our guys pulled him over. And uh, so they got his name and, you know, information. And then they started asking because, what was he driving with a commercial drywall vehicle? And they started asking about the case. They said, now here's the part you're not going to believe. He said, the guy confessed. He said, I saw on TV where you're looking for me. And I only thought it was a matter of time before you're going to catch up with me. <laughs> of course, then he withdrew his confession later. But of course, we had his DNA on every single case. So um, let's see. No, I guess this just says the same thing. Uh, why are you looking for me? Okay. Anyway, um, I was just going to quickly go through uh, the dust analysis with you, with, with you, which I thought might be interesting. Most of what you see here are uh, our skin cells. And across the pores, what you see is a lot of calcite in there. There aren't other metals. First, I thought, oh, it's just, you know, some calcareous rock. But it's all this narrow size, right? There's nothing else there. I said, this is like the stuff when I'm watching people work. I work coming out of sanding drywall and stuff. Let me just look there. I think there's, there's uh, I think there might be uh, gypsum there. 
And eventually, oh, this is a, a greater view. I just want to see. So there's actually a gypsum crystal that you can see. But most of the gypsum from drywall, if you ever looked at it, is not that obvious. It's all broken up kind of stuff. So I took a little bit of dust, just all I did was put a drop of dilute HCl on there, warmed it up, let it recrystallize. And of course, the gypsum needles all over the place when it just simply recrystallized. So even though I couldn't see it necessarily, the gypsum was all over the place. So what have I got here? I probably got somebody who's working around drywall. That's exactly what I would expect to see. And there weren't the other outdoor minerals there. There was pine pollen. That's how we could get the, uh, excuse me, not pine pollen. There wasn't pine pollen. It was oak pollen. This is, this is oak pollen, the way it looks, which is one of the few pollens that we can actually identify in a resonance mount. But here, and this, so I acetylized some. That's the way it looks, um, the way you're supposed to look at it, which I normally do for soils and so forth. But there were also little white spheres in here, which you can see over under the black sphere on the left-hand side is by transmitted light. Of course, it's not black, it's opaque. So there are white spheres over there. I picked those out. They're an acrylic latex or, or acrylic uh, paint, so they're most likely, at that point, an indoor um, paint. Certainly, they appear to be outdoor. But that brings up the thing, why, why are they using spray paint if they're, they're um, uh, uh, you know, drywall finisher and stuff? Well, if, they, if the project's big enough, my, my feeling was that they wouldn't roll it on or brush it on, they would spray paint it. And that's where I came up with commercial operations instead of some home type operations. And in fact, and this, is, this is where the difference is, and also the, also the penalty differs for being wrong, between making inferences to further an investigation and giving testimony in court. In court, you, you have to be as sure as you possibly can be. In this work, you have to be as sure as you possibly can be of your facts, but you also have to have, and those of you who remember Kirk's crime investigation, and I, this would have been a good place to put the quote, so you have to adopt the, uh, Kirk talks about the, the, uh, the good qualities of a, of a research chemist and how you have to have all these things, but you also have to use your imagination in a creative way. Not to make up stuff, but to sort of think of what are the possibilities for this happening? What are the, you know, what are the likelihoods of this stuff? Anyway, it all turned out to be um, right. Um, so in conclusion then, um, I believe that we pursue an investigation microscopically by accumulating the facts. Uh, and as history has shown, you know, not letting your own the ideas of your beautiful theory get in the way. When your beautiful theory is wrong, you've got to discard it or at least get, get rid of the parts that aren't working. Um, but you can't, you also, um, I would defy anybody in this room, no matter how well-intentioned, to do this kind of work using standard methods that are available to you. It requires a standard method, but not the one that you might be thinking of when I say standard method. The standard method that works is one we learned back in grade school and pursued through our college uh, um, careers and hopefully through our own uh, scientific careers, um, and that is the scientific method. That, I believe, is the one that works for these. Uh, resulting facts, then, which you need to make pain, take pains to, to uh, explain to the people you're reporting to. What are the, what's the factual part of what you're doing? What's the inferential part of what you're doing? And then um, you can perform this uh, kind of work, though, again, on material for which there's nothing to compare it to. And with that, um, if there is time for questions, which I guess there's a couple minutes, I would be happy to entertain those if you have any. But I uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you found it interesting uh, and uh, that it was, uh, take it for, for what it was. It was. It was supposed to be somewhat inspirational, I hope so, but also it was supposed to be palatable uh, after your dessert, basically. So thank you all very much.